So let's take a look at brain oxygen in ME-CFS or myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome. You can probably hear that I'm sick again, but I've been promising to share some new data for the past couple weeks. And so I thought I can spend a few minutes to do just that and share some of this information with you. So I'm Dr. Younger, I'm Director of the Neuroinflammation, Pain, and Fatigue Laboratory, and today I'm sharing um, kind of first ever seen results from my laboratory. So this is before it's been published, before it's been presented at a conference, before it's been shared outside my laboratory in any way. Only myself and my graduate student have seen these uh, data. So to recap uh, earlier videos, this is an MRI scan that I can use to tell whether or not your brain is getting adequate oxygen, whether there's good cerebral perfusion. Now, when there's not enough oxygen reaching the brain, we call it hypoxia, and that will interfere with every function of your brain, and it'll create symptoms that can look a lot like ME-CFS. So it's something that we want to scan whenever we're researching ME-CFS to make sure that they don't have a hypoxic brain. It's important to, to rule that out. So I'll link to videos if you want some background information on this. Toward the end of this video, I'll show you how to get to those other videos I did a few weeks ago. So a few weeks ago, I did the scan in Gulf War illness and found that many of them actually have problems getting uh, oxygen to their brain. But today we're going to do ME-CFS using the same scan. There's a big caveat, as I spoke about last week, the people that are being analyzed in this data set I'm about to show you, they have mild or moderate ME-CFS. And that's because they had to get to my institution twice, one to do a bunch of blood tests and another time to do the imaging. So by definition, they couldn't be severe or very severe because they were homebound or bedbound. So we don't know what the scan would look like in people who have the most severe forms of ME-CFS. So, so, and I can't extrapolate that. We would have to find a way to get them to the scanner and measure them. So I can only, the, these results only apply to people who have ME-CFS, but are able to get around and get to the place where we're doing the scan. So it could look very different in the more severe forms. So what I'm gonna show you are five different groups. There's gonna be uh, healthy females, then females with ME-CFS, that's what we're going to be focusing on today. But I'm also, since I have the data, I put out three other groups. There's long COVID. That's a very small group. There's only four people. So I can't really interpret those data. We, we need more. Then there's the male Gulf War illness veterans. You'll see in a, just a second. And uh, again, it's a male group, all veterans of the 1990-1991 Persian Gulf War. And then there's a group of veterans from that same conflict, same war, who don't have Gulf War illness. And again, you can look at that if you want, if that's helpful, but we're really going to be focusing on ME-CFS uh, today. So let's take a look. Now, each circle here is one person, and the score is on the left of the image. And you can see that there's a range of between 10 and 80, and this is milliliters per 100 gram of brain tissue Per minute, so it's how much oxygenated blood is going through uh, brain matter, and there's a target we have that's around 50. And I'm going to show you this um, slide real quick. Uh, these are levels I I described a few weeks ago. You know, anything 50 or above is good. I mean, I guess there's an exception if it's really, really, really high that could indicate uh, uncontrolled hypertension, but really 50 or above is great. Anything between 40 and 50 is probably just fine. When it starts to get between 30 and 39, there's a possibility that this person's problems have something to do with poor oxygen availability to the brain. And then when it gets closer to between 20 and 29, then we're having more severe issues. And if it gets below 20, this is an, an urgent problem. So keep those in mind. So let's take a look at the data. Now, I'm going to show you really quickly kind of behind the scenes look of how I 
look at data when it first comes in. What do I look at first? Now, one of the first things we want to look at is, are there any erroneous values? Did the scan mess up? These, these, the equipment and the processes are very complex, and there's a lot of places where things can break down. And so I have to make sure that the data look right first, because I don't want erroneous data to contaminate the data set and um, make us make mistakes in our interpretation. So what I'm seeing here uh, looks fine. Looks like the scan is working like it should. I see there's no crazy high or crazy low values. There's some uh, concerning high and low values, but nothing that is beyond uh, belief. So we see values that are a little bit below 80 on the high end. If we look at the low end, we see a couple that are close to 20, and we see one that's closer to 10. That is very concerningly low. So we'll have to look at that person very closely. But again, uh, those are possible. And then we see the majority of people kind of crowding around the normal level, which is about 50. And this is the average right here in the green line. And that's hitting right at, I mean, within a point of 50. So it's right where we would expect the average of all these people to be. So, so far looks good. So now let's do what we're really interested in. Let's separate out the groups. So again, we have five groups. We've got our healthy MECFS, long COVID, Gulf War illness, and non-Gulf War illness veterans. And again, we're focusing on the healthy and MECFS. So here's the averages. These are just a simple average for each group. And we can see that the healthy is a little bit above 50, and the MECFS average of cerebral perfusion is also pretty close to 50. It's a little bit lower than the healthy group, but it's not statistically um, lower. Now, the other groups, long COVID, Gulf War illness, non-Gulf War illness veterans, those all tend to be lower, but we may look at those at another time. We'll focus on healthy and MECFS. So the, the most important thing here is that on average, the MECFS group, when they're laying down and being scanned with arterial spin labeling, they don't appear to have any major issues getting oxygen to their brain. That's what these scans are showing. Now we can see that there's some exceptions here. So this red line I'm putting here is at 30. And we see that that's kind of the severe line where you don't want to get below that line, or you probably do have some problems with um, brain oxygen. And we can see that the people who are below that line are either MECFS or Gulf War illness, with MECFS being more likely to be quite a bit below that line. And so I see about four people here that I should look at very closely and probably talk to them and have them do some additional tests with their uh, clinic or hospital to find out what's going on here. Because these could be problems with uh, oxygen supply to the brain that may have nothing to do with MECFS, but it might look similar. So really, um, in general, I don't see any evidence. In, in general, in MECFS, as a whole, as a group, I don't see a problem with, or a structural problem that prevents oxygen from reaching the brain. Now that's what I expected to find. Now the study um, that yielded this, these data, this study is not about uh, brain oxygen. This is an additional scan that we put in there. The study is about neuroinflammation, but I wanted to add this oxygen perfusion scan just to rule out problems with um, structural problems with oxygen reaching the brain. So I did not expect to find a difference between MECFS and healthy, but it's worth checking. So the data look as I expected, and it shows that there doesn't seem to be any structural problem keeping oxygen from reaching the brain. When I say structural, that's a very important word because there's structural and there's functional, and those are very different. Now structural, we're talking about things like um, ischemic stroke, like a clot in an artery that's keeping blood from reaching your brain, or a cerebral hemorrhage, so you've had a burst blood vessel somewhere in your brain. It could be a vascular malformation, so some congenital problem you've had your entire life that keeps blood from adequately reaching one of the regions of your brain. It can be a heart defect or heart disease that's keeping um, oxygen from entering the blood supply and being adequately pumped into the brain, or it could be uh, vessel hardening, so your vessels don't dilate properly, 
to get more oxygen to the brain. And there are many others. But what I can see is on average, these types of problems do not seem to be what's causing the symptoms. And so we can rule that out in general. Now, if I went to a brain oxygen expert like Dr. Peter Rowe, and I said, hey, I got all these MECFS participants. I put them in the MRI scanner. They all laid down and their brain oxygen looked fine to me. I have not asked him this yet, but I'm going to guess that if I said that to him, he would say, well, yeah, of course, that's what you saw because they're all laying down. You're not going to see the problem with people just laying there. And that's because the problem with brain oxygen in MECFS is a functional problem. It's a system that's working incorrectly. And so it depends on what they're doing, whether or not you can see the problem. To be able to see the oxygen problem in MECFS, you have to have them go from lying to standing up, or you have to have them do a table tilt test or some kind of physical exertion task. And those are things we can't do when you're inside an MRI scanner because you're not, you can't move or else we can't collect the images and there's no room to move anywhere. It's a, it's a small bore that you lay in. And so we can't do those tests in the scanner. And so what I'm talking about now are functional issues. And, you know, those things are not captured by this particular scan. So I'm talking about things like um, orthostatic intolerance, dysautonomia, or POTS, which is postural tachycardia syndrome. These things that have already been associated with MECFS, I can't test those using the scan in the MRI. Our, our bodies have an incredibly amazing system for maintaining proper blood pressure when we change posture. Um, and if it didn't, we would faint every time we tried to stand up. So it's the system of pressure detectors on our vessels going up to the brain, coordinating with our autonomic system, coordinating with our heart and our blood vessels, so that when we change position or change exertion, the vessels react to maintain proper oxygen to the brain. And again, if it doesn't, there's all kinds of problems you can have, including um, fainting. These systems can fail and that's what's been proposed in a lot of cases of MECFS. Again, it takes different tests to test, to gauge those types of things. And we'll talk about those in another video. So if you are concerned about proper blood oxygen reaching your brain, especially if it's something that you notice when you're standing or when you're exerting yourself, this scan that I talked about today is not the best way to test that. You'll probably want to use a Doppler ultrasound device, like a handheld device that can be used in a clinic so the physician clinician can do certain tasks to test what's going on. Again, with MRI, you, you have to stand still. Now, this scan that I did that I talked about today, it is very good at finding the location in your brain of a poor perfusion issue. Like if you had a small stroke and there's a region that's not getting adequate oxygen, this scan will show that. You can't do that with Doppler ultrasound because it can't get inside all the regions of your brain. So there are some great advantages to the MRI scan that I'm using. Uh, I'm not going to show you that today, and that's because I got this, these data out and these results out very quickly. And when I show you the whole brain average, that's pretty quick to do. But to look piece by piece at the brain, that takes a much, much longer. It takes longer to process, longer to analyze, and much longer to interpret. And that's because every person could have a problem in a different part of their brain. And so it takes a lot of investigation before we can present results. But it is important for me to look at that and to look at each brain and to look at perfusion in all the different parts of the brain because you could have someone who has an overall average blood perfusion that looks fine. It's like at 50, but they can have one little region somewhere in a critical area that's not getting proper oxygen. And the overall value wouldn't show that because it's an average of this whole large brain and that would mask over a small problem. And so we, we will look at the, at the, at the brain piece by piece, but not right, not today. So that's it. Um, just a little sneak peek on the type of work we're doing. I hope that little information is useful and, and the sneak peek I hope is uh, at least interesting. Uh, next week, I have not decided what I'm going to talk about. I feel like there are at least 50 things that I want to share with you right now. 
but I will pick one for next week and I will be back on Monday. Thanks.